So my name is Sarah Mauck and I am the co-chair of the Educational Programming Committee. Eat it. <laughs> and I'm really excited today to introduce our plenary speaker. Uh, before we get started, I do want to uh, let our virtual attendees uh, know that um, if you have any questions, please include them in the chat. And uh, we encourage everyone to complete an evaluation and the link for the evaluation will also be in the chat for our virtual attendees. <laughs> uh, it is my pleasure to announce Dr. Lydia Tang as our keynote speaker for this year's conference. She is currently an outreach and engagement coordinator for Lyricis. Previously, she held archivist positions at Michigan State University, Library of Congress, and numerous graduate positions at the University of Illinois, where she received her MLIS and Doctor of Musical Arts degree. She is the 2020 recipient of SAA's Mark A. Green Emerging Leader Award and a co-founder of the SAA Accessibility and Disability section. She is very involved in advancing accessibility in archives through standards development with the guidelines for accessibility archives for people with disabilities and open source technologies, including archive space, collection space, and DSpace. She has written about accessible physical archival spaces, hiring and advancement practices, taught accessibility workshops for lyricist learning and the Midwest Archives Conference, and delivered keynotes on accessibility and archives for best practices exchange in 2022 and Code for Lib in 2023. She is currently co-editing a forthcoming book for Litwin Press with Dr. Grayson Brillmeyer, Preserving Disability, Disability in the Archives Profession. Please welcome Dr. Lydia Tang. Hello, Ohio Archivists. It's great to see you. I'm really excited to see you all. I've worked with many of you in many different capacities. And I'm really excited to talk to you a day today about accessibility in archives. So this comes at a great timing because this is actually happy day after the Global Accessibility Awareness Day. So this happens every year on the third Thursday of uh, May. And this is an international day of awareness for accessibility, and so this is perfect timing. And I want to start with a little story, because that's where a lot of beginnings start, is with one person and maybe two people. And so this, the story I have goes back to uh, 2012, and I just had a date. Uh, and I watched this person um, who said he was legally blind on his OkCupid okay profile just walk away and step up on the curb and not have any trouble just walking away. And I thought he must be lying. And uh, it turned out that um, we had a lot to learn about each other. And uh, so I was a new graduate student at the University of Illinois. And uh, I was so excited to share with him about this profession that I was going into. And I brought him to an exhibit and I said, look at all this stuff, this is what I do, isn't it great? And he said, I can't see any of it. And it was all behind glass and the labels, he couldn't see it. So I went, well, huh, okay, how do we make this work? How do, how do we make archives accessible for people like, like this guy who turned out to be my husband? And uh, so as things went on, uh, we went along and uh, we were going to get married in Oregon. And uh, so my mother-in-law came out for the wedding and my eyes were opened up to the family that I was joining in terms of how much accessibility was a part of this family and the lack thereof of accessibility with uh, an immune system that was suppressed after two liver transplants and a kidney transplant. 
uh, my mother-in-law had to go through an airport and get on an airplane, and she made sure not to eat for 24 hours in advance of getting on the flight because she didn't want to use the bathroom on the plane. And I didn't realize that that was a thing, but this happens all the time. A lot of people can't navigate the bathrooms on an airplane. And her wheelchair was broken by the airport, or the, air, uh, the workers. And this happens all the time. And that was the beginning of how I became so aware on a personal basis about accessibility. And it also answered a lot of questions for myself as well. Because with my husband being a scientist and a very logical and orderly kind of person, and myself being very flighty, and this is a picture of me uh, leaving to go to the airport for my very first keynote and having one shoe on and one sandal on, this is kind of how I roll. And so it eventually made me uh, become aware of different aspects of neurodiversity and begin to answer some questions and give vocabulary for things that I had observed and experienced, but didn't know what they were or if there were any patterns like it. Like words like time blindness and, and uh, like an explanation for how I have a Tetris of different calendar holds and reminders and alerts just to remember where to show up. <laughs> So anyway, going back to, to uh, coming back to my archives class after showing uh, the exhibit to uh, my future husband, I told my archives professor that I wanted to focus on accessibility in archives. And he was like, well, you can. I mean, like, um, it's kind of niche. Or... And uh, so I was just like, it's a good thing I don't pay attention very much. It's a good thing I don't listen very much. In fact, I will prove you wrong. And uh, so that's what I've done ever since. And so I started presenting at the Society of American Archivists about accessibility and started getting to, getting to know the work that had already been done. And uh, I was so excited as a new archivist that there was a task force to revise the best practices on accessibility that was just getting it sprung up. In fact, they had already picked out all their members, but I had to be on it and I reached out to the chair. And uh, so this was a task force to revise the 2011 best practices on accessibility that our Michelle Gans had helped co-author. And from there, we went on to spearhead founding the Society of American Archivists Accessibility and Disability section. At the time, what had happened is that the best practices had been created, and then it kind of sat for several years. And it didn't, it took until a Society of American Archivists president broke her ankle, actually, that she became. Uh, aware about accessibility issues too. And that's why she initiated this task force. And I knew that if we did not have a community of practice that continued to talk and innovate on accessibility, it was going to sit for another 10 years, which is why we went, uh, we created the uh, accessibility and disability section. At first, the petition uh, gathered the minimum amount of signatures within less than 24 hours of it being circulated. And it ended up with uh, over 300 signatures. And at first it was brought to council. And again, the answer was, that's pretty niche. How will you sustain this? And so I ended up having to assemble a visioning committee. And these committee members became the future steering committee members of this group. And uh, we revised our proposal. And then at the next SA annual meeting, it, 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 we heard that council approved it finally. And then from there, we were approved in August. In March, 2020, archival repositories were shutting down all over the world because of this pandemic that was just coming through. And we were seeing posts on social media about displaced archivists. And they were desperate for work from home ideas. And so what we did within the section is we just put together a Google Doc 
We're not too techie. We're just trying to make it easy to exchange ideas about how to do work from home. So the ideas about this was that we would com combat the assumption that archivists could only work on a site to save jobs. And uh, by, uh, by extension, if archivists can work remotely, why can't it be possible going forward? And this is particularly important for archivists with disabilities. So it was a tremendous act of professional solidarity. Everybody was adding so many different ideas. And uh, so there's on my slide here, um, a popular meme that was developed by Archivist Memes. So this is my claim to kind of popular culture archives history here. Uh, so the uh, meme has uh, a young person say, hey guys, I'm feeling nervous about the impact of COVID-19 on my career as an archivist. Any tips? And uh, some burly guys say, hey champ, there's actually, I wonder if this is my, I, hmm. hey champ, there is actually, hmm. sorry, I'm, I'm pausing briefly because the microphone is going in and out. But anyway, I will keep going and I apologize. Hey champ, there are actually tasks that archivists can do while working remotely. The essays accessibility and disability section has a great resource available just for this. And also uh, another burly guy says, keep an eye on the displaced archivist hashtag that's being used uh, for archivists that are getting laid off. And then the last uh, uh, profile of another burly guy at a laptop says, excellent suggestions, friends. And remember, if you do get unpaid leave, be sure to look into an employment process for your specific location and things like that. So uh, many members of the Accessibility and Disability Section Steering Committee also became the originating members for the Archival Workers Emergency Fund Organizing Committee. So we were approaching the pandemic response basically from these two different angles. The second angle, was to crowdsource funds uh, in mutual aid to support laid off archival workers. So the fund was established by the Society of American Archivists Foundation in April, 2020. And by the time it closed um, uh, a year and some later, it, supported, uh, it was supported by 998 donors and we distributed over $140,000 to help 188 archival workers in need during that time. We also created surveys and webinars and organized craft auctions to help fundraise. And so this Archives Dino, which I think is just an incredible, incredibly creative thing uh, that our peers created. Um, this Archives Dino was made by Sarah Matuski in Michigan. Um, just, uh, it was a rallying point for everybody to help each other during this time. And this is an incomplete uh, class profile, I'd say, of the people that helped create the Archival Workers Emergency Fund. And many of them, again, identify as people with disabilities. And I would say that living with a disability means that you have to have a certain type of creativity and flexibility in order to work and survive in a world that isn't always friendly at all to your existence. And so that type of resilience is what helped with this project broadly. So fast forward now, here we are now. The, the Americans with Disabilities Act has a new Title II that was signed into law just this past month, as of April 24th, 2024. And this requires state and local government entities to be compliant with WACAG 2.1 AA standards within two to three years. So this is an interesting new development in terms of law that basically says that uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, so this is an international standard for web accessibility, is now being backed up with legal teeth to, uh, to ensure accessibility for uh, state and local governments. Now we have this Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, we're currently on version 2.2, but now we're going, uh, we have a draft version uh, 3. And we also are marking this occasion because 
stemming from a section that even had its existence questioned in the beginning. We are now on the verge, and this verge has been pushed out a couple times with various extensions of deadlines, but um, this forthcoming book uh, that Grayson and I are co-editing is Preserving Disabilities, and we are so excited about this project because it is bringing together disabled archivists and disabled scholars and talking about the archives profession from a disability first perspective. And now here we are, here in this space, having a whole conference dedicated to accessibility. And so I just want to acknowledge this, that we have come a long way. And this is something that we all should be so proud of. So I shouldn't have to uh, have a, a slide about why does accessibility matter, but I hope that we can see from this that in our own small way within the profession, we are also part of a legacy of activism and resistance and innovation that happens around accessibility and disability uh, uh, throughout our society. Accessibility is the determining factor for if someone can access information and services. For a, white, a website, for example, that is not built with good standards, my husband can't access it. In fact, he can't access a lot of things. And so that makes my life a lot harder too. So uh, this is why um, we all, this is so important for all of us. We, as stewards of cultural heritage, we have so many stories to tell and we want to make sure that all these stories can be seen and heard. And also that we are sharing the stories of people that also historically that have been marginalized, silenced and uh, removed from society. This is a, accessibility, even though there is laws, lots of laws and regulations and stuff like that, it shouldn't only be about compliance, but it truly is about equity and inclusion. So let's intentionally cultivate a culture of care. According to the Centers for Disease Control, uh, one in four US adults or 61 million Americans live with a disability. This is a lot of people and uh, in, in many ways, uh, people who are disabled are one of the largest demographics there are, basically. Um, most people will become disabled uh, at some point in their life, whether it's temporarily or permanent or situationally, and accessibility benefits everyone. So what can you do? So a rallying cry for the disability rights movement is nothing about us without us. And so the idea with that is that you don't want to have somebody just be like, this is what you need, you just need to be over, over there. And not engage truly in a dialogue about what would actually help you, you know? So uh, it's so important to engage with the disability community. And I do want to admit, uh, acknowledge that the disability community is not a monolithic thing. There are many different types of disability and disability is experienced on a very personal basis. So somebody with the same types of disabilities will experience things differently still. But think about who is your community that you serve and who are your experts in disability in your organization or nearby, or who are the people that are doing this work already and whose perspectives are can help you basically. So um, if you are an archivist, if you are in archives on a campus, there is probably a disability resource center. If you are a governmental organization, then there's usually some sort of disability center too. And um, I wanted to point out that um, the Smithsonian has this very inspiring group called the uh, Expert User Expert Advisory Group. And so this is a group of stakeholders of disabled people uh, that will help the Smithsonian walk through all of their spaces and go through all of their online content and provide feedback 
a, a dialogue basically about what is working, what they need, and what could be even better. So as you in, engage with people and really start to open your eyes to see what disability can be like and also what are patterns of inaccessibility, then um, there are some certain themes that might emerge. And so these patterns of inaccessibility uh, for me are assuming that everyone has uniform abilities. That's the first one. So somebody that sees one thing might see, see it a certain way. And some people, like this is the example of um, a vision simulator uh, for macular de degeneration will show that this is uh, how somebody else might experience it, basically like a cloud over the center of their field of vision. And I'm going to show an example of my husband demonstrating, uh, my husband, Jeff Spada, demonstrating uh, what he sees or what he can't see using various assistive technology. Standard view of a Gmail account, uh, somebody who's not using an accessibility feature. Um, if you scan over to this uh, computer, this is the same Gmail account, uh, but using a high contrast mode through Microsoft uh, Suite. Uh, so okay, you can see some of the features are kind of more faded out, a little bit harder to see in some cases. Uh, and then if I turn on Zoom text here, this is what somebody sees when they're uh, magnified, a very small portion of the screen. So again, depending on what accessibility features you have, uh, there's something to think about when you're designing a platform or a website, um, how people are seeing what you're designing. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Another pattern of inaccessibility is lacking the flexibility to accomplish things in multiple ways. So I was actually playing a symphony concert uh, last week, and my stand partner had a tablet instead of regular uh, written music. And that was very interesting to me because what I noticed from that is that they could expand out the music so that way the staff got bigger so you could see more. You could also expand the background uh, brightness so that way the color contrast is even stronger and uh, you can also use a foot pedal instead of manually with your hand stopping playing and then changing the the page and so it's similar to that a lot of people uh, like my husband who use a various uh, visual um, assistive technology might use uh, some sort of technology that uh, manipulates the way that they are able to see the content. And so an example of that is being able to invert the text so that way you have a black background with white text or even change the font itself. And so there's an example on my slide of this dyslexic friendly font. And so what's interesting about this font is that basically it's slightly weighted on the lower half. And so that can be especially helpful if one has dyslexia because um, there otherwise is a risk of transposing the letters and then flipping them around. Another pattern of inaccessibility is that accessibility might be considered an afterthought or optional. And so I have two pictures of disgraceful accessibility seating that I saw at a university once upon a time. And so what we have here are two chairs that are probably from the 1960s and they both have these uh, stickers on it and it says, do not remove from this room, a handicapper needs it. So not only is it um, extremely offensive, they're also using an extremely offensive old word as well because this is uh, hearkening back to old days of disabled equals bigger, which equals hand and the, the basically you've got a cap in your hand kind of thing. So it was just bad all the way around. So um, let's see here. Think about who is missing and ask if they are, if they are shut out. An example of accessibility being an afterthought is Hunter's Point Library. They had a renovation that was, I believe, something like $41 million. And when they opened the doors, only after the fact, they realized that their fiction stacks were completely inaccessible because they could only be accessed by stairs. So that caused a major uproar. And there's 
little details about that. Um, it's very easy to see almost anywhere. So on the other side of the slide, I have a picture of a, a door with an automatic door opener, but the door opener is blocked by some canisters. And so if there was somebody, say, who was using a wheelchair who had to get close enough to push that button, they would not actually be able to access that to get through the door. And that is exactly what happened. So uh, I invited a friend of mine who uses a wheelchair to go through our legacy special collection space. And uh, I, I wanted to see from his perspective what it was like to encounter our spaces and our services. And the first obstacle we encountered is he could not get through the door. So the door was inset in a way that there was no cutaway. So if somebody was actually using manual wheelchair, they couldn't actually get close enough and then leverage themselves to open up the door. So that was the first problem. And uh, this is contrasted by the new revised uh, reading space that has completely much open spaces and barrier-free doors. These doors were basically propped open, held open, uh, slid open, uh, so nobody had to deal with any doors. And on the left side is the legacy reading room, and once I helped him get into the door, then there he was, uh, and he encountered the front of a, a wall, basically, because the uh, reception table was very high. And so that reception table works well for the average, the quote, average person, right? Uh, so they could stand there. But if you're coming at it from a smaller height, it's like it's one insult after another, right? You can't get through the door. And now you're just, you, all you can see is like the top of somebody's head. And uh, so on the other side is an example of another space that was renovated within the library I was at um, that has a different type of desk. So this desk does accommodate multiple heights, basically. So there's a tall ledge for people who would like to like write their notes and the registration and things like that. But then there's also a lower height for people to engage at that height level as well. And uh, continuing on with this uh, wheel through, Basically, uh, my friend couldn't even get around the aisle because the aisles were too narrow. So again, it was a very eye-opening experience where it went from, oh, well, we haven't encountered this issue before to, oh, this is why we haven't encountered the issue before. Nobody can get in. And then uh, the picture on the right side is contrasting that with how the reading room uh, was updated. So much wider aisles and adjustable chairs and also uh, some adjustable tables within the room as well. So going back to the uh, exhibitions, I was always trying to figure out, how do I share what I do with my husband? And uh, we started to get better. Uh, so we made very sure uh, to angle content and labels so that way it could be accessed from multiple views. And um, I was also, I'm sorry. I was also working on uh, normalizing the workflow of making a digital equivalent to the exhibit as well through the uh, lip guides. And so what uh, the idea with that was that um, there's a prototype of this uh, frame that I was hoping to do, a tactile frame that I would post in a very consistent spot on the entry point to the exhibit. So that way, if somebody needed to find it, they could just find this tactile frame, point their camera, their cell phone camera at it, and then be able to access all the electronic exhibit labels and alt text for the images. Uh, so that was an idea that I had that I didn't quite uh, get to bring to fruition at the time um, since I moved on to a different role. Uh, so another thing about exhibitions is incorporating multiple senses. And so these are other examples of things that we did. We had a 3D uh, tactile printed book. Uh, so it was relatively inexpensive beyond the time and the filament for the 3D uh, printer to create this thing. And so that way we could bring it out uh, and allow people to touch it without any concern for it being damaged. And also we got a sound dome for our exhibit space. 
So I was previously at Michigan State University and they have an amazing oral history repository as well. So we were really hoping to incorporate sound into our exhibits as well. Another thing that we did is we did an Able Eyes tour of our uh, space. And so this is especially helpful for people to get acquainted to how the space is. Um, a lot of people want to see what the space is like so that way if they predict any areas of concerns, they can raise it up at the time. Uh, another thing that we did is also create profiles of our um, classroom spaces. So it showed um, what accessibility features are there, such as dimmable lighting and adjustable tables and chairs and things like that. And also uh, a good practice to have is to make sure that your repository, if it doesn't already, has some sort of accessibility statement. So the, the statement might have a couple of different elements to it. One would be being sure to have a contact information for anybody who has any uh, questions or requests about accessibility accommodations to reach out to, whether it's an individual or whether it's a whole committee of people to help facilitate their visit or their experience. And then also elements about what is accessible in their space, such as, again, height adjustable tables or any other kind of aspects. And also to be transparent about any known accessibility shortfalls. So knowing that we are archivists and that we do work with historic documents and sometimes in very historic spaces that are not quite accessible, being transparent about that and also documenting and being as clear as possible about any other alternative paths for access is important. So uh, moving on, I'm going to transition to talking about digital accessibility. So again, this is especially important now with Title II uh, um, emphasis about bringing uh, digital content up to accessibility stand standards. On the Global uh, Accessibility Awareness Day website, they have a a uh, very impressive bar graph about accessibility issues uh, that the Web Accessibility in Mind or Web AIM group um, uh, looked at. Basically, they did a broad survey of many, many different types of websites, and uh, they found that 98% of websites have some sort of accessibility issues. So accessibility issues in websites are widespread, and there are some things that are, we as archivists uh, have in our control, and there are some things that might be in more control of a developer, uh, but it's very important to do what you can. And so some of the main issues that most frequently happen for accessibility in websites have to do with headings, alt text, and color contrast. So um, basically, screen readers um, navigate, uh, they're kind of stupid. As in, what I'm trying to say about that is they follow whatever road signs are in a document or a website, for better or for worse. And so if there are no road signs uh, that are embedded in the document, such as embedding headers, so like say if you have a Word document and it's a string of text and you've got a title and you just go ahead and click title, click title, and then um, you click uh, a certain other area to be a heading one, and then it gets like a font that's slightly big but bolded, and then a heading two is slightly smaller. And you go, well, okay, um, I mean, I guess it's okay. I don't really like the way it looks, but um, okay, it's just formatting issues. Okay, whatever. But actually, to a screen reader, that all that all that information is so important. And the reason why is because if it's not there the screen reader will start at the top and it will go all the way down to the bottom. And so this can be absolutely exhausting for anybody who, who is reliant on a screen reader. So they're not able to browse the way that somebody who is cited, like if they're giving a 20, a 20 page document, they go, okay, well, flip, 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 flip. Okay, all right, I see some relevant words. All right, I can jump here. If uh, somebody's using a screen reader, they will not be able to see that. So that's why it's so important to have these various headings because the screen readers can hop from heading to heading to find relevant content. And another thing to note is that they can also hop 
from hyperlink to hyperlink. And so I have a, a screenshot here of a very common and very annoying personal. Uh, I'm very personally very annoyed by this. Uh, is that uh, it's a common style to write uh, some text and say, click here. And that is so utterly aggravating and annoying because the screen reader, as it's navigating, jumping from hyperlink to hyperlink, what will happen is it will say, link here, link here, link here. And so the very important thing to note is that you need to have descriptive hyperlink hyperlinks because otherwise it's just simply unusable for somebody. So next I'm going to talk about the reading order. And so uh, it's very possible that one could create a, a document that looks fine. It might even pass an accessibility test just fine. But actually, depending on the reading order, can be unusable for somebody. And this is an example of this. Uh, something that just looks visually nice but doesn't work very well with the screen reader. It reads down the column but doesn't necessarily make any sense as somebody reading with the screen reader. Last one. Last two, four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So here you can see it read off the box and folder numbers first but it never got to the title. So somebody using a screen reader has no idea what these numbers are for. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, as I'm experimenting with all these things, trying to show him what I'm doing. Uh, another aspect of uh, document accessibility is making sure that the font, it's the fonts that you choose are accessible. And so something to note is that sans serif font, so this is the font that is not with fancy ligatures, is in general more easy to read. So that's something to just think about. Times New Roman is a very popular font, but it, it is not as easy to read as like Calibri or Garamond or things like that. And also, do not rely only on color to convey significance. So in my web, in, in the slide here, I show an example of labels from the Trello board. And uh, so what's interesting about that is that they also incorporate patterns and text in addition to the, the colors, but I also have to ding them because their color contrast is not very good. So they had it half right, right? So the text of white text on yellow is not good. White text on light blue, also not good. White text on light green, no. Uh, and uh, I also have a screenshot of an example of how a traffic signal might be seen by somebody who has various aspects of color blindness. So it's one of those very ironic things that's ubiquitous in our society of having the traffic lights have red and yellow and green. Well, unfortunately, one of the most common forms of color blindness, there is a, an inability to distinguish between both red and green. Another important aspect for you to advance accessibility is to test it out yourself. And some ways that you can do that is by using a tool called Wave. So this is a free tool. It's a website uh, that basically you can just drop your institutional uh, website URL into this uh, this uh, field basically, and it will do a very quick uh, diagnostic test basically on your accessibility. And uh, it's great. Um, I also have it as a, a extension for my web browser. And so I can just click it on, click a button basically, and it can do a diagnostic across anything that I'm looking on in the web. And so an example of this is it will show things such as missing alternative text, missing uh, uh, form labels and things like that. And it will also analyze the structure. So that's that can be really helpful. Uh, the Digital Accessibility, um, well, the Digital Library Federation's Accessibility um, 
Digital Accessibility Working Group has a really wonderful auditing shortlist that's very helpful. It's, uh, you can also try testing using TalkBack, VoiceOver, and other common paid programs such as JAWS. So a lot of systems have built-in technology. It's getting a lot better. It used to be pretty bad, but uh, so say, for example, Apple. Apple products, they have VoiceOver. Uh, I have an Android phone that uses TalkBack. You can just toggle it on and test it out yourself and think about how much of a steep learning curve it is for anybody to have a reality where this is, this is what they have to use in order to access anything. And um, it's very humbling too, because it, it, um, it, really, it really exposes a lot of, like we've said, uh, issues about web accessibility. Uh, so also test in the dark mode and also high contrast mode, and also be sure to engage and compensate disabled people to help with user experience studies. So nothing is more effective than bringing in people who live and use these assistive technologies on a daily basis to really get their honest feedback. And nothing is more insulting to disabled people than to be on the support line with uh, the accessibility specialist for an organization and uh, the specialists say, it's accessible. And the person says, Haha, I've just been on wait for, I've been on hold for an hour and you're telling me it's accessible. I'm calling to say it's inaccessible. It doesn't work. So passing an automated accessibility does, test does not mean that it's actually usable. Another important aspect about ex expanding accessibility is make sure that you have alt text for your images. And so for a screen reader that's encountering images without any alt text, basically it will say image. That's it. And so there are now some sites that are using AI to generate some uh, uh, alt text automatically, and it's not super great. So this is an example of our kids, uh, a picture of our kids, and Facebook made an automatically generated alt text. It says, maybe an image of one person standing, food, and indoor. The alternative text that I provide instead is two children messily playing with their food. You see, there is nothing that can compare it to actually making sure that it is done right and well. <clears throat> Another important aspect of accessibility is making sure that you have captions for your videos and audio description. Yeah, yeah, I've got to find the right spot. Okay, all right. I've got to not move. All right, <laughs> it's okay. So uh, so what I mean by that is, um, so uh, I got a Society of American Archivists Foundation grant to caption all of the, um, all the backlog of uh, essay education videos. And um, I used this program called Rev to do that. And now with some hindsight, I have more thoughts about that. So I would say definitely if you are looking to get a lot of your video uh, captioned, there are a lot of tools and services that you can use. Uh, um, I hear that Whisper AI is a very popular tool. If you do decide to go with some sort of service, then be sure to investigate their compensation, um, their ethical compensation for the people that do the work. Uh, so while Rev was very helpful in giving a flat, well, a predictable rate for the cost, another aspect that I hadn't factored into at the time of writing this grant, and I'm sharing it because I don't want anyone else to make this mistake, is the amount of labor that is still required to, to fix these uh, captions. And so what I mean by that is uh, that technology is getting better, but it is not perfect and it is not smart either. I mean, so uh, I had to make sure to go through and check, especially for jargon and especially for names and check the context of the language too, just to make sure that it worked. Because another insulting thing for people that need captions is to experience 
using them and seeing all the mistakes in it and seeing that they are not valued and their time is not valued because the is the captions are not correct. So uh, since we are a bunch of archivists here and we are working with a lot of uh, historic records, I wanted to also talk about digital uh, the document accessibility. So scanning a PDF by uh, scanning a document by itself will basically create an image. And that is just as bad as the earlier image too. So you may have a lot of text, but if a screen reader encounters it and it can't find anything, it will just say, it can't do anything. So then you might run an OCR, optical character recognition across this document. And it is also, could be incoherent as this example on the slide. So this is a, a, an example of a really bad scan of a really bad printed document and is just a bunch of gobbled gook basically. So some uh, repositories are exploring more creative ways of uh, remediating some documents. So uh, I was just talking with uh, the Council of State Archivists uh, folks at the STEER event that was happening yesterday. I'm sorry that I couldn't tune into the other events that were happening online here, but um, they recommended a service called From the Page that is one of many different technologies that might make it possible to engage the public and empower them to help transcribe documents and to help make it more accessible. So another aspect of accessibility is about accessibility and inclusion in the workplace. And so that topic in itself, can, it's, there's a lot to go in here. And so what I do want to say with it while I have the opportunity of the microphone is to really interrogate all of your practices, to really think about how to make it more inclusive for people with disabilities. Some aspects of that might, might be uh, sharing your interview questions in advance. This is very helpful, especially for people with anxiety. Um, it's also, I mean, it, we shouldn't have to say something as basic as having a rubric, but being sure to use that rubric, especially to interrogate notions of fitting in or like other aspects of personality and things like that. I mean, it's so important to make sure that that there's not like a targeting of neurodiversity and things like that that can happen often. And also to uh, be more flexible. So uh, whether it's a, a hybrid schedule or a fully remote schedule, I'm so happy to say that after this Archivist at Home document that I actually got a remote job. And that has been amazing for me. I didn't realize it at the time, but, and, uh, and, I am a good performer after 20 years of being an orchestra, but I can be absolutely cripplingly terrified of people. And so uh, this is a kind of hard event for me, but I'm actually, this is my third keynote, so I'm okay. But what I do mean by that is that being in a remote environment, I can control my interactions with people. So I can put on, put on my face, go through my meeting, turn off the camera, and then curl up a little bit and uh, process a little bit. And that is helpful for me. Uh, another thing to think about in terms of accessibility is your office, your desk, the way that you transport materials, the equipment and technology, things like that. How do we make uh, the archival profession and the archival workspaces work for people and not just the boxes that we love so much? And, um, for modes of communication. For example, my husband uh, is a professor at Michigan State, and they love to send PDFs for their communication. And as somebody using a screen reader, their PDFs are not the most accessible thing. So that's that can be a real problem. And so the team has to be really aware about that and willing to change because it's so easy to just be like, well, it doesn't work for you, but we're still doing it because it's so convenient for us, which is another way of saying you don't matter. So uh, really uh, think about the communication uh, across your team. Uh, also be aware of the evaluation process. And again, how sometimes that can be particularly problematic for people who are neurodiverse because there are different ways of communication and sometimes 
it's very easy for people to get kind of ganged up on if they don't fit into the norm. So in this slide deck, which I'm hoping that I will share out to you all in the future, and I apologize that I haven't yet, is uh, there's a link to the Job Accommodation Network. And it's an amazing clearinghouse of various ideas for accommodations for many, many different types of accessibility, uh, of disability. And so I want to kind of move on now and talk about advancing accessibility on a structural level because I think it's uh, kind of ironic that here I am, I'm an archivist and I no longer have collections. Uh, I'm actually in sales. Um, but another thing that I do do is uh, I am in a very lucky place because this organization that I'm part of, Lyricist, has so many open source uh, softwares connected to it. And I'm very happy to share that as of yesterday, I just got a promotion to finally incorporate my accessibility work formally within the organization. So they better buckle up because I'm ready to go. <laughs> so with archive, archive space, this is actually one of the reasons why I think that I was picked for my role in the first place was actually because of the work that I did before becoming a staff member. As uh, uh, at Michigan State University, they were an archive space member institution, which allows uh, staff to participate in governance and leadership within the open source community. And I was the chair of the, de uh, the development prioritization sub team. And I called it the sea of wishes. <laughs> Because this is uh, this graph is actually the Jira repository of open tickets. These are all the things that people, these are all the tickets of uh, of people that would like an archive space to improve or expand, and uh, it was staggering. So the upper line is the number of tickets that are open and submitted, and the bottom green line is the number of tickets that have been resolved. And so my task was to establish the agenda and help get everybody through this huge backlog. And so what I did is I realized that you can kind of put your little finger on the scale a little bit in terms of um, prioritizing a bunch of accessibility tickets, which is what we did. We took it and ran with it. And so that is something that was very helpful there. Another thing that I did is uh, I chaired the Staff Interface Enhancement Working Group. This was an ad hoc uh, team of 40 people around the world. So we were dealing with global time zones and we split up into many sub teams and we focused on various areas, whether it was navigation or time saving or usability or accessibility and made lots of recommendations for continuing to improve the accessibility of archive space. And now I have actually been very involved in collection space and D space. And so uh, they hired an accessibility consultant a couple of years ago and uh, the developers were kind of overwhelmed by like, what do I do with this report? It's 12 pages long. I mean, how do I fix this? And so talking about Jira tickets, I made hundreds and hundreds of Jira tickets and we are moving forward with that. And I also created the, uh, Voluntary Accessibility Template, so the VPAD uh, for Collection Space, which is a document that now uh, describes the level of accessibility compliance with this software. So here's some examples of the tickets. And so what I'm doing with this, the direction that I'm going is basically, how do I create systems uh, to help accessibility. So as you folks are working with your collections using potentially the software, how can I make it easier for you? So the idea is that accessibility should be easy. It is not easy. As I was just preparing this keynote, there are some slides, if you've seen some other keynotes that might seem kind of familiar, but one thing that I noticed is that as I copy over and rearrange and of course revise and update these slides, the alt text does not carry over. There are some steps that can make it a lot easier. I'm trying to make an accessible PDF, there's an easy way to make a PDF and a multi-step way. The easy, quick way of doing a print to PDF 
loses all the accessibility features. That is not right. That should not happen. And so yeah, make accessibility easy, ingrain accessibility into workflows. So we are doing that on a structural basis, basically, with um, like proposals and things like that. If you are um, if you are building like a grant proposal for a project or something, if you ha have an accessibility component, this allows people to think about accessibility again, not as an after afterthought but as part of how it should be, and then operationalize it. So uh, another aspect of this is Princeton University. They have really gotten involved with the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, and they have incentivized all, many of their staff to get certified for accessibility. I know I'm uh, getting some desperate looks from people, so I think I'd better move fast, so I will. So in summary, you will encounter obstacles with accessibility. And some of them we've talked about already. Accessibility is too niche. I don't need to say that is not something you should say to people. So accessibility is wide, it is vast. It is a natural um, spectrum of humanity that we need to incorporate. Accessibility is too expensive. Unfortunately, it is expensive but it needs to be done. And there are some resources to help with that. So there's an example of the libraries transforming communities through the American Library Association. This is a grant opportunity. Sure, it's for rural and small organizations, but there's also opportunities. And then who will lug the boxes? We just have to move beyond that. And so one way to think about that is just make sure to not frame it as a job requirement. So there are things that people can do, as Michelle had mentioned earlier, they might choose to have smaller boxes or shelves boxes by size. So you don't have the super high ones on top and also explore different types of carts and things like that. I had encountered a, um, a roadblock where I had all these visions about what I wanted to talk about at this annual meeting, but I couldn't actually implement many of the ideas that I hoped. And all I could have was the adjustable table. And I felt so bad to walk up on stage and just talk about adjustable tables. I felt like a failure. And then years later, I attended a seminar and somebody from the Library of Congress said that they had attended my talk. And because of my talk, the Library of Congress now has adjustable tables in their reading rooms. So it starts with us, it starts with you, it starts with me, it starts with us, basically, that we all have to get started together to advance accessibility. So join a community of practice and learn and join up with the Accessibility and Disability section, join up with the Digital Library Federation Digital Accessibility Group, and there are additional accessibility communities, and be an ally. So don't put the burden of advocating for accessibility only on disabled people. It is hard to be a disabled person. It is also hard to be undiagnosed officially, but still be disabled. There are so many structures that work against us. So use your voice and use your privilege to open doors where, uh, where they are closed and hold others accountable for accessibility. As vendors for VPATs, there might be somebody like me behind uh, the, the, on the other side of things that goes, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let us do that. We're happy to do that. That's our job. That's what we should be doing is uh, to advance accessibility in our corner to do. And everybody here, commit to do one more accessible thing every day. Whether that is, do not do a click here hyperlink. You, you might uh, like write it out and then go, okay, how can I rephrase this to be a more descriptive hyperlink? Or maybe it might be color conscious choice or something like that. But do one more accessible thing every day and we will make it better together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tang, for a very informative and wonderful presentation. Uh, we are coming to the end of the hour. We're really happy to take questions. Does anyone have any questions here? 
Do we have any in the chat? Yeah. So a question in chat is, what are some of the most inaccessible fonts on websites and in documents you commonly encounter? And what are the best alternatives? Uh, that's a good question. It's also very subjective, so it's hard to say. But in general, some very stylized script-like fonts. So the ones that most often might uh, might imitate my kind of handwriting are probably not exactly the best type of fonts to use, is what I would say. Something to note is that um, that somebody using a screen reader actually would not be impacted at all by the font since the, it's embedded the certain way. But if there is somebody that does have low level of vision, that can be quite a problem. So like I'm thinking about, all right, I don't have a good one exactly. Papyrus might be kind of pushing it, for example. So try to stick with more of these standardized uh, non serif fonts. If you do want to have some more stylized font, make sure that it's quite big, not super small. Oh, OK. Any other questions come to mind? Yes. Thank you. Do you have any tips on working with designers who may, oh, <laughs> they, they, uh, <laughs> do you have any tips on working with designers who may want to uh, make artistic choices or color choices that are not in Britain best practices for accessibility? Or do you have any resources we could point them to? Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, yes. So there are some, um, like, uh, for example, I'm just thinking about universities with their communications team, and they have, I'm going to speak by the other mic. I'm thinking about uh, universities with communications team, and they're so proud about their institutional colors, and yet, their entire logo is inaccessible because the color contrast is bad. And so it's hard because you gotta, you, uh, what I would do is I would connect them with the um, accessibility or disability support uh, person or team within that unit and say, you guys find it out. Uh, but basically what you could do is uh, you could say, oh, hey, you know, I ran that wave checker on this thing and there's some errors that are coming up and it does say that there's a problem with the color contrast. Do you have any solutions? And this can be a learning experience for them, hopefully. And so one thing that can be a kind of workaround is thinking about maybe having the text in a box that has like a white or a lighter colored background. So that way they can do their thing in a very stylistic, visual kind of colored way, but the text and the color contrast are better. All right, we have um, time for just one more question if anyone has one. All right, well, I'll ask. Um, so there are tons of resources that you have presented uh, that we can learn more about how to make our spaces and our collections more accessible. So. Would there be guides available for like design best practices in design? And could you point to a couple of them that, that come to mind readily? Sure. Uh, so I would say uh, I, I talk about Michigan State University because I used to work there for six years. So I know it pretty well. And I do know that there's a lot of really great um, like accessibility resources that relate to communications and design as well. So if you're on a, some sort of university campus, I would definitely look in that area. Michigan State University really does have a powerhouse of accessibility that I also was learned from and inspired by. So there's a lot of great documentation there, and I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of other great university resources around this country too about that. Well, thanks again. A um, round of applause for Dr. Kim. All right, um, just a few minutes for the hour. So um, feel free to take a quick break and start the next session at two o'clock.